Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. GlaxoSmithKline, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. GSK have separated their business out into three main segments. These are consumer healthcare, that stuff like mouthwash and toothpaste, vaccines and more traditional pharmaceuticals. They've got around 100,000 employees worldwide and around 12,000 of them are R&D bots. They actually manufacture the pharmaceuticals and ship them and sell them as well as just researching them. Now, it was greatly to my surprise when I first looked at GSK that they've had such an exciting time over the last five years. When I'd looked at their numbers, there was a nice steady increase in income and operating profit over the last five years. But I should point out that pharmaceutical companies are a bit like oil tankers. In 2016, the CEO was forced to quit by hedge fund activists. There was a bit of a boardroom struggle and they forced him out because they wanted to get rid of the consumer healthcare part of the business to just concentrate on pharmaceuticals. So the CEO left, the CFO left actually in 2018 and the chairman left in 2019. So this is quite a lot of drama that I wasn't expecting when I first came in to look at this company. So the CEO that they had was called Andrew Whitty and he'd actually been with the company since 1985 and worked his way up. He was against breaking up the company and that's why he ultimately stood down. They got in place this kind of flash new CEO called uh, Emma Walmsley. So I listened to her on some of the more recent analyst calls and my general impression that she was kind of very she liked to kind of gloss over things a bit she was kind of a bit uh good at sales but i i don't know overall she kind of rubbed me the wrong way i'm not sure um so this is obviously a bit of um a bit of a problem for looking at this company right off the bat when i find out that they're completely transforming their their strategy in the next few years and so there, it makes them a bit of an unknown when I was looking for more of a safe harbour with uh, the most recent stock screen I was doing. To give credit to the new CEO, she's definitely focused on what the shareholders wanted, or in particular what the activist hedge funds wanted. And um, they've actually done it in quite a, a clever way. So what they've done is, in recent years, they've bought up more consumer health care assets. So much so that they're like on an even Stevens with Pfizer's consumer health care business. And their proposal is to form a new massive consumer health care business that combines the products of both companies. And they've said that they're going to then spin off this new company in 2022. So this will form a new company. And then what I then like about this is if you buy some GSK stock now, you'll end up with two stocks for the price of one kind of thing. So other in the last five years, other big kind of milestones was they got approval for Shingrix and a Trilogy Ellipta, which is a respiratory product, back in 2017. They, were buy they bought out 37% of the uh, consumer healthcare unit they own jointly with Novartis to enable, to, do the, in, to enable them to then do this deal. And um, they uh, went into a, a partnership with a company called 23andMe. Now this is interesting because these are guys where you send off a little uh, swab sample from your cheek and then they go and profile your DNA and send you back a report of of uh, who your ancestors were and all this. So um, 
I'm sure you've seen them advertised on TV. But I bet what you didn't know is that this company, when you send off for your profiling, they've got a little box that's, that you can tick that says, I don't want my my data to be shared for medical research. And then what they're doing is they're, they're actually selling this data from all the people getting their um, ancestry read out uh, to they're selling that data to GSK to help them select better drugs. Now, they've said that they're going to focus on immune system and oncology drugs with a focus on genetics and genomics and this kind of thing. So that plays into that. Uh, they also bought in 2019 this company Tassaro for four billion. And from doing that, they got a load of oncology assets and new products. So um, they boosted their, their oncology pipeline that way. And one final thing to mention that I noticed, and it was a small one-liner RNS, is uh, I noticed that their CEO is actually now got on the board at Microsoft as a non-executive director. And I know that CEOs are, are often, CEOs are often on multiple companies' boards, but I just kind of question the motivation there. Um, so it's, again, like a little bit of a, a negative to the overall picture. So a general theme with GSK, having got to this point, is that I can't really use the historical numbers for a really good idea of what's going to happen in the future. So I thought I'd have a closer look at their sales. So as I said before, they split their company into pharmaceuticals and vaccines and the consumer healthcare is going to be spun off for this new company. Now, the vaccines is a big chunk of their sales in its own right. And then within pharma, they have established. So these are all of their main products, but then which have gone off patents or are being manufactured by generic competition. They then get put in this established bucket. And then their strong areas now are respiratory and HIV. Now, those are going to still do OK. But they're, but I can say in summary that their established is going to drop. And so really, this company, all their future hopes really are on these two segments, the oncology and immuno. Um, so. I'll just quickly uh, go through some of how I got some of those assumptions. So to start with, start with, with the established, um, the established pharmaceuticals, they're, they're expected to drop 30% over the next four years. So this will be dropping. We need progress elsewhere. The vaccines, look at that beautiful gradual increase. And uh, when you then look at their, their current products, you see, particularly with this shingles product, it's called a Shingrix, that's for shingles. That's, um, you know, big growth, big product. And they make good money from their established vaccines. And actually, unlike established pharma, vaccines are a lot, they're quite complicated products, so they're a lot harder for the generic manufacturers to copy. And um, so, so, yeah, so if I go on to the uh, vaccines, um, they're really doing great guns and analysts have predicted 7% yearly growth for ages. Then their HIV, which used to be a GSK mainstay. Um, so HIV drugs, um, they're kind of good. They'll be doing OK. Um, they're going to certainly flat, uh, flat line or go slightly up with some of the newer products they've got. Um, and then when you learn, look at um, oncology and immuno, there's very little 
in terms of sales for those. Um, so like I've said, they're supposed to be their new main focus areas, but they're still on the runway. So overall, the, the shares are all, the, overall the, um, the revenues from sales are going to kind of flatline. And um, I've, I've put on this, on this chart, I've got their net income history and I've put in the, um, the analyst estimates and they really are looking at the, you know what the analysts predict you know the professional banker types are pred predicting they're going to flatline so um and actually at the at the latest um, analyst report the gsk fd actually said that they he expected sales to drop four percent this year 2020 and then flatline so this these results of flatlining is a different trajectory of the past where we were gradually going up a bit relies on success of all the new products coming in in oncology and immuno they're focusing on immuno and oncology in order to get off the runway and still then be just flatlining we've got to rely on these taking off so i then look in a bit more detail not at current products, but products products that are waiting to be approved. So in oncology, they have this uh, Zedula, which they've already launched um, as a fourth line treatment for ovarian cancer. But they're also doing a clinical trial for it to be a first line treatment of ovarian cancer. And this is expected to bring in maybe a billion of sales by uh, 2024. They've then got this um, this other cancer drug, Dostalimab, which kind of is giving small revenues, up to 200 million. And this multiple melanoma drug, which is about up to 700 million. So they've got stuff coming through for oncology. Um, and then their immunoinflammation uh, there's one big product that could be a, a billion pound product and that's for lupus treating lupus it's called a uh, Ben Lister and um, they're targeting approval in 2021 so you can see some products going through for immuno and for oncology and like they like the analysts have expected they think that with these additional products, they're going to make up for the loss in established. But overall, the bottom line is that for the sales to flatline over the next three or four years, they've got to get these new product groups to go get off the runway. And that to me, it's, you know, it's kind of exciting, but there's risk, a bit of risk there. You know on its own it doesn't kill them as an investment idea but it's a certainly a significant little problem to think about um there's just uh, i looked at some of the other products um nothing major but um one interesting one i thought i'd mention is they have this aid drug that I kept on uh, looking at the, the data and stuff and the reports on it. And I had to keep on um, double taking what I was hearing. But as far as I can make out, it is a freaking cure for AIDS. So that's obviously a very exciting product. And it's an injection. So it's not like the dream AIDS cure, which would be like a tablet that you, you, you take once a month and you're cured forever. But it's, um, you know, pretty damn exciting how effectively it works. You basically can't get AIDS for two months if you take this. Um, unfortunately, this product, the, the data doesn't come until 2022. So it's definitely well worth mentioning something really interesting. But um, not really relevant to this analysis. So looking at the numbers, 
So the profit and loss, as I said, there's a nice gradual increase of income, operating profit and net income. However, this was mainly the work of the previous management, not the current management, because like I said, pharma companies like oil tankers, it takes five to 10 years for your new drugs to be uh, developed, approved, and then sold. And then for those sales to build up. Uh, we, we know, like I've said already, that the, um, this income is expected to drop and flatline. And there's a noticeable increase in the um, S SGNA, which is sales general and administrative costs. So these are considered, this is considered an increase in bureaucracy within the company, if you like. And um, it's not, it's a little niggle on its own, it's nothing. Um, but this was mentioned actually by one of the analysts in the, the call they had with investors. So the assets and debts was very interesting as I looked through it. There were some very noticeable changes, particularly in 2019. So one is that the net assets grew massively from 4 billion to 18 billion in 2019. And when I looked into that, it turned out this was when they went on a shopping spree buying some consumer healthcare assets to help bring about the um, this spin-off so they can form a new company with Pfizer. That then added onto their balance sheet about f uh, $4 million and um, in goodwill and 12 million can you believe in intangible assets so they've bought a load of new products off gsk sorry they bought them off i think novartis um, to bulk up so they had enough to go in halves with pfizer to form a new company and these uh, consumer healthcare products they're things you know like sensodyne panadol chapstick so these um, have known expected sales, and that's the goodwill. And they also have um, brands that you could sell. So that's the intangible assets. So that explains this massive increase in assets. I was kind of tempted to then start going down the avenue of, wow, they've got loads more assets but the same share price, let's go all in. But I kind of stopped myself from doing that because I don't quite understand the accounting stuff behind this. Um, in terms of debt, um, their debt, in order to fund these purchases to make that happen, they put on debt and they're actually, you know, about 5 billion in debt and more now. Overall, their net assets are much higher, but um, they've took on a bit more debt. And uh, something else is they bought up a few um, companies, like they bought uh, Tesaro to add new oncology drugs to their pipeline. And that's uh, something that added to their debt as, as well, which is kind of a bad thing. But overall, they've got loads of assets, loads more assets than they did. Um, but it could be some kind of accounting artifact because they're they're kind of putting their financial structure together in a way that they can then bud off their consumer healthcare products to form a new company. So uh, then looking at their equity, and their equity goes up massively from four million to eighteen million. And uh, this uh, 15 billion's new equity is again related to those purchases they made. Um, that's then, and they've got, so they've got like retained earnings saved up that will be within that new company. Um, and they've got non controlling interests um, where there's this new company, company forming. 
so when you when you look uh, and on my spreadsheet I've got I've now got these charts that automatically uh, update and um, when you look at this for net equity it looks crazy what's going on here but the um, the basic explanation is they've gained equity on their balance sheet it's part of these new purchases and it's related to this uh, massive consumer health care um, company that's going to be formed um, so in summary then um, I really like the idea of buying one company and then you get two for the price of one kind of um, but overall there were just too many little niggles which in combination I do not want to invest in GSK they had great numbers but these were from the work of five years plus previously and it was hard to equate those numbers to this completely new company that's being formed they had a good CEO in the past who was forced out by activist hedge fund managers and uh, the CFO and chairman has also recently left my gut feeling is that I don't really like the new CEO based on listening to her at the analyst calls she's kind of a bit of a a bit she kind of puts the gloss on things a bit a bit of a saleswoman not so much of a details person and it just didn't I don't know she just kind of rubbed me the wrong way a bit the new CEO also she's uh, recently joined the Microsoft board which I noticed and is again a little a little weight against buying this company um, most sales growth so they've got the growth estimated to kind of flatline the next three or four years but it depends on two new product groups oncology and immuno and they say that they've restructured to form this lean new company focusing on just oncology and immuno but we've got no previous history of gsk coming up with the goods in developing and selling these products so then there's a certain level of doubt i have that they're going to be able to launch all of these new products that they've specified um, to then to then grow the company's profits as currently expected so again a doubt a question mark where i was looking for kind of more stability in the growth and finally they employ 12,000 scientists but most of their new products recently they had to buy off other pharma companies rather than developing them themselves so yes yeah, so overall too many nagging questions for me to go into this stock but it was well worth everything I've learned from looking into them and I look forward to perhaps looking at them again in a few years or also applying what I've learned here to look at some other pharma stocks